Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Now, this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by our wonderful friends at ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. As you're hearing this episode, the ASA conference for 2019 is just weeks away. It's going to be in New Zealand. It's perhaps a little bit late for you to... um, to come, not to say that you couldn't buy a chicken and just show up on the day, but it is an exciting time. I'm going to be recording lots of episodes of the podcast at the ASA conference. So even if you can't make it, I hopefully will be able to bring you all the new knowledge that I gather there. But meanwhile, you can follow ASA on Facebook. You can join them by going to their website and just generally think about supporting ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Now, this is a really special episode of Knowing Animals. This week, we're doing something a little bit different that I've not ever done before. I'm joined by Dr. Joshua Lobb. Joshua is Senior Lecturer in Creative Writing in the School of Arts, English and Media at the University of Wollongong. And we're actually going to discuss Joshua's recently released book or his novel. It's called The Flight of Birds. Now, it's published by Sydney University Press. And in particular, it's their animal public series within that press. And Joshua and I are here today in the beautiful offices of Sydney University Press and the grounds of the University of Sydney. So welcome to the podcast, Joshua. Thank you very much. It's really nice to be here. Thank you for asking me to come along. My pleasure. It's wonderful to have you on the program. So Joshua, what led you to write this book? Look, I I think I can tell you the precise moment of inspiration. Um, I was walking along, um, this is a funny thing, this, this is what writers do is we have kind of moments where a whole lot of thoughts we've been having suddenly all come together at the same time. I was walking across uh, North Wollongong Bridge, which is just a busy traffic bridge in Wollongong. It's above a train line. Um, there was a whole lot of cars all buzzing along really loudly, horribly. Um, I was really stressed about the emails I had to write and I was really worried about the planet and all sorts of, you know, sort of fears that you have. Um, I looked down into the, onto the railway station. There were a whole lot of kids having a fight on the platform. Everything was kind of horrible. Um, and I looked above me and there were three black cockatoos just above me. And they dropped to eye level. And there was a moment where I was actually, I felt like I was eye to eye with one of the uh, black cockatoos. There's a nice kind of yellow fuzzy um, ring around the, the eye and, then one by one, the black cockatoos dropped and flew under the bridge and flew away. And I suddenly thought, I'm in exactly the same space as you. We're operating in the same world, and yet your experience of this world is completely different to mine. And it just changed the way I was kind of experiencing the world. There was something about being not invited into the world because I can't speak for Um, the black cockatoos, but there was something about having that moment. And from there, um, I started just realising that there were so many birds around. I live in the Illawarra where there's just, you know, lyrebirds and whipbirds and cockatoos and galahs and kookaburras, magpies everywhere. And I sort of realised how many birds I saw in a day, how many birds I heard every day. And I realised that there were some birds that I had really close relationships with. There were magpies that I sort of nodded hello to. And there were lots of other birds that I, you know, that we as humans had really harmful relationships with as well. So I started to think about the kinds of stories we tell about birds, but the kind of stories that birds have that we also ignore. So it's things like, um, you know, the birds that that we eat, um, those kinds of stories that are missing, the birds that are going extinct, um, and we kind of erased those stories. So it, it was about trying to think through what's going on in, in the everyday, which has an impact on the lives of animals. Um, but it was also that kind of really interesting idea that when you're on the local level, that you are also engaging on a, on a planetary level. So my interactions with birds, our interactions with birds, are, are an echo of what we're doing with the planet, to the planet. 
Um, so it sort of it was the the large and the small which kind of um, sort of triggered the writing of the story. So each story that I tell in the book ha- it has its at center a different bird, and each story has it has at center a different kind of relationship. So there's, uh, as I said before, stories about birds that we eat, birds that we have killed, um, but there's also birds that we have that we bring into our homes. Um, there are birds that whose habitat we invade. There are birds who we come across on a bushwalk, which we have a different kind of relationship with as well. So I'm trying to think through each time how how those intimate moments have a have a larger impact um, on the world. Wonderful, and you you write your family into the story often. Uh, I assume it's your real family, not a fictional. I, I write. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because I, I mean, I, in the story, there's a there, there's a man who has he's married to a woman. He has a daughter. I don't have any of those things. Oh, okay. But I um, I do, I do write the stories of families into into the into it, and I do write the stories of my own childhood. I think that the, there's a lot in the, in the in the book which is about grief. Uh, kind of local grief, which also becomes a kind of planetary grief, and that's certainly my own. But yeah, the funny that's what writers do is that we take things and we manipulate things. But it's it is I do certainly write lives, human lives, into the book. Yeah. Oh well, one. I mean, I've I've met you once before at a conference, but I was very much taken off to your home watching television with your wife. So that's an amazing credit to your writing. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. Yep, thank you. In the lounge room with you. Yep. And so it, there, there's families, there's people, there's, there's relationships, but there's also other things as well. There's the animals, there's cultural um, icons and things like that. How did you make your decision about the um, environment to traverse, what to include? So yeah, it's it's interesting you say that because each story has its own kind of form as well. So some stories are very what you'd call fictocritical that they're almost essays and they talk about the kinds of um, they're almost using academic research. What kinds of stories we tell about birds? What kind of scientific stories we tell about birds? And others are very poetic. Um, and I think I was trying to find the right the right kinds of stories that we we can use to talk about birds or other animals. Um, non-human animals so it's it's part of what i think i'm doing um and we can talk about whether i'm successful or not on that is is trying to think about what kinds of stories birds might tell rather than what kinds of stories humans might tell about birds so part of the experiment in the book was to think about what kinds of different ways could we talk about it what happens if we talk about it about birds scientifically what does that do to birds what what happens if we talk about them poetically? Is that the right form? So it is about kind of trying to explore different ways, and and, and it was a lovely um, experience because it was such an experiment uh, on on all sorts of levels. Because I would say to myself, okay, I'm going to write a story about magpies, and I would sit with magpies. Um, so it was a great research project. I would literally sit with magpies, watch magpies, see what they were doing. I'd I'd talk to everybody about magpies and hear the stories. Um, from everybody about how they were swooped when they were eight years old, etc. And I'd read lots of um, books about magpies and the story would form around that. story would form around my kind of moment with, with the birds. Um, so, yeah, different forms kind of came out of that. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's... Um, I mean, it's incredibly diverse, the styles and modes, and it strikes me that you really you know, extended yourself, you, you, you know, it's it's an amazing piece of work. Just out of curiosity for the uh, budding authors among us, how much time elapsed between your encounter with the bird at the railway station and the release of the book? Uh, Yeah, always a long time. Uh, I, I started writing the, 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 the book properly in 2014. So, not four or five yeah, years, right. four and a bit years, yeah, yeah. Um, and I was. But I was. Th- those ideas have been in my mind for a lot longer than that. But I didn't know what to do with them until I had that encounter. Um, so yeah, the funny it, writing is a really strange thing because sometimes a story. There's a story in there which is the the hardest story f- that I had to experience when I was writing it. But at the time it took to write was very very short. So this is a story about a, a man driving home from work who. Um, hits a Rosella with his car and then doesn't know what to do um, to protect or, or to, to save the bird. So it's a really kind of um, upsetting encounter, um, not a kind, careful encounter at all. Um, so it was 
terrible to write emotionally and it was terrible to rewrite because I had to keep revisiting that moment. But actually the first draft came out very, very quickly um, and it was it, um, yeah, it was another moment that I had where I suddenly knew the first line and the last line and it kind of pours out. So for a writer, you're always um, you're always thinking and then suddenly the right phrase comes and the thing pours out. And I think that's what happened here, that I would let myself explore and experiment and experiment and then the right thing would come and it would appear, the right phrase, the right sentence. Yeah. Mm, wow. So I was fortunate enough to be at your book launch where Melissa Boyd – had, you know, really beautiful words to to say in praise of your book and it was clear to me that she was very moved by your writing. And another person I spoke to um, told me that she had been, I think perhaps at a reading you'd done elsewhere and that she and other people were moved to tears by what you said. I mean, you've obviously done a really amazing job. It's very emotional. Was that purposeful? What's the role of emotions and getting emotional responses? The role of emotion in this in this context is crucial. We have to um, care, and that's where emotion comes from. Uh, to me, the writing of this book has allowed me to think much more about being careful, um, and a careful with a double L almost that be full of care, um, and so. It's really, it's, it's, it's absolutely vital that we think emotionally about our relationships with non-human animals but also with the planet. Um, we, it's very, very easy for us to shut things down and not engage emotionally. Um, and the book is about, is about the grief that we feel because, the, because we have this disconnect from the world that we, we feel absolutely, um, we know that there are things that are going terribly wrong and yet we don't engage with them. And so, yeah, I, I really, yeah, I mean, I found this traumatic as well as cathartic to write. Um, and I wrote it on a, a very personal level. And I'm, I'm, I can't say pleased because I don't want other people to go through that. But I'm, in a sense, I, that, that's the response that I would want from readers that, that they take this on in a very careful way and try and think through their own relationships with other humans, with other non-humans and with the world more, with the more than human more generally. That's, it's crucial that we do that. Mm, wonderful. So, Joshua, I wonder whether you would be kind enough to read a section from the book. Um, I mean, I'd like to encourage listeners to purchase a copy if they can and if they can't afford it, then perhaps – Ask their institution to order a copy if you work at a university or a, a student at a university. Or alternatively, this is the kind of book where I think you could very easily approach your local library and ask them to purchase a copy. So, um, you know, if, if you can't afford it yourself, I think there are ways in which you can get it out there for people to share. But would you read us a passage? Yes, and thank you very much for plugging my, my book for me. I really <laughs> appreciate that. Um, so I won't read the story about the, the, the man and the car and the Rosella because that one is I, – I have read out publicly before and I find that quite hard to read. So I'm going to read a, a, a story a, – a section from a story which is much more hopeful than that. Um, it's the second last story in the collection and it's about – um, two humans um, who are one of them is an island ecologist um, on Cabbage Tree Island, which is um, uh, just off Port Stephens in northern New South Wales. So it's a real island um, with a, a real island bird sanctuary. Um, and on the island is um, a whole range of birds, um, but there's a protected bird on there called um, the Gould's Petrel. So this is a story about the island, an island ecologist and um, she's invited her father to help her with her research on the island and she has a kind of difficult relationship with her father but she thinks that if he engages with her research then he might think differently about the planet and about their relationship. So this is towards the end of the story um, and so it's about them looking for Gould's petrel nests um, to record their nesting activities. We'll head re west up the mossy slope We'll squeeze our way through the teepee of knotted vines. The nest will be in a natural rock cavity, held within the lazy curve of a fig tree trunk, a ragged, mouthed portal. I'll reach my hand inside and my fingertips will brush against downy feathers. Dad, I'll say. He'll be standing between two tall cabbage tree trunks, holding the data sheet against his chest like a security blanket. 
Dad, I'll say again, you'll want to see this. As gently as I possibly can, I'll draw out the nestling. The chick will wriggle, fluff its wings, grey and soft and fragile. It will look like those clumps of lint that we used to scrape out of the, the door of the dryer. I'll cradle it between my hands. He'll edge his way closer. He'll steady himself, his palm pushing into the rough bark. His mouth will open and close. The bird will twitch its dodo curved beak. I'll offer him the chick to touch, but he'll teeter back. I can't, he'll say. Please, Dad, I'll say. The body will feel warm and alive in my hands. I'll hold the bird out in front of me like an offering. The golden green light of the forest will make the feathers glow and hum. Please, Dad, I'll say again. I won't know why it'll seem so vital for him to touch the downy bird. I'll know exactly why. This bird will fledge and fly and transcend. It will follow the rim of the Pacific, trace the currents of the Tasman Sea, hairpin along the coasts of South America, trace the scent of fish along the line of the equator. It will sleep and soar and dive and drift. And then it will return. It will circle the island and fly down through the canopy and land right here, right on the spine of this fig tree root. It will be part of a flock of a thousand birds, or two hundred, or ten. It doesn't matter. It will return. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Joshua. That's no lovely. Worries. And, you know, I actually used to live in Newcastle. I did work for the National Parks and Wildlife Service for a while and I know people who do such work. I should say that I mean, one of the things that I've been saying to a lot of people with this book is that I say thank you for writing the book because so many um, – so many people contributed to the research and to the conversations about the book. And I'm indebted to Nicholas Carlyle, who is the island ecologist that I, who oh. invited me onto the island. Wonderful. Um, and I had the most extraordinary, inept weekend for me because I was very clumsy and he was very <laughs> kind to me. Um, but it was really wonderful to spend time with these birds and on this beautiful island. And I... I'm, I'm interested in the notion of intervention because they've, they've uh, the ecologists have created nests for plastic box nests for these birds, um, which may seem to be a kind of odd way of intervening, but they've had amazing successes, and then they have been ha they've had moments where the birds have nearly um, become significantly endangered again, and and they've they've been able to bring them back from very very close um, to all dying. Um, and so I think that there's something very interesting about that idea of being, again, being very careful on the local level. Um, and we can speak about conservation in all sorts of ways and how it could be seen as problematic, but I could see a real difference with a real relationship between humans and birds and that, and I was very moved by that experience. Mm. Oh, lovely, mm. wonderful. Joshua, I ask everybody who comes on Knowing Animals to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? I certainly am. <laughs> okay. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? Yes. Um, it was Freya Matthews um, and it was Living with Animals. So it's from the early 90s and I think I probably read it in around 1995 or 96. Um, and it's a very, very simple, complex ideas, but a very, very plainly told um, uh, essay about what we do on an everyday level with pets. And I was really inspired by how it ask different kinds of questions about our relationships in that space. Mm, wonderful. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? I think it was to do with this book. It's, it's very funny because I was talking about this with a colleague and she said, you've always been writing about, about animals. You've always been writing about um, the planet in this kind of way. But the first story in this book, which is not the first story that I wrote, but it's the first time where I think that I kind of – got it right is a story about a, a man in the in the bush who hears the wail of a, of a child calling and in the end it turns out to be a lyrebird that's been calling and right at the end of it is a, I write a paragraph which says um, the this is what the lyrebird is doing at this point I don't pres presume to think for the lyrebird but I, I kind of describe what the, the lyrebird is not thinking of this as a child's wail the lyrebird is playing with the music and I think that's the first moment where I thought I really am trying to understand what a bird story is like. So I would say that's the first time that I became thinking theoretically about a big, about pro-animal. 
Wonderful. Yep. Amazing. If you had to name one animal study scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Uh, without a doubt, um, Deborah Bird Rose, um, who is, an ex- is was an extraordinary writer. Um, I had the really great privilege to go to a, a presentation last week at the Grounding Story um, Conference, Environmental Humanities Conference, uh, up in UNE in Armidale. And there was a presentation which is uh, all her colleagues called Remembering Deborah Bird Rose. And it, it made me realise how important um, her work is. Um, there's an amazingly sad essay that she wrote called Judas Work, which is about wild donkeys in um, uh, Western Australia, Northern Territory, uh, which is th- the most heartbreaking um, uh, story that I've ever read. Um, but I was taken very much by something that, that um, Tom Van Doren said at that um, in the presentation where he quoted um, her, and, I, and it's a quote that I hadn't actually heard before, but it speaks entirely to my kind of way of thinking. She said, um, where one person or species knowledge stops, someone else's knowledge picks up the story. And it's not a linear relationship, but it's that idea of having a conversation or an encounter across species lines, which I think is really important. She also said um, there are there are limits to what we can know and what is ours to know, but I think that that it's about trying to see where those limits are, and I I think that that's really important that it's, that we think about how our knowledge can be shared across those kinds of lines. So I think definitely um, Deborah Rose, Bird Rose is mm. an amazingly rich writer. Yes, of course. Well, mm. Vale Deborah. Mm. Mm. What's the most important thing academics can do for animals? I think, again, it goes back to the notion of care, Um, that what we do, what we say is not just what we say, it's what we do. Um, So if we speak with care, then that that certainly, if I speak with care, that certainly encourages me to start acting with care. Not always, I'm not perfect, um, but that's my aim, and I think that's, that's what I get again out of what Deborah Bird Rose writes is that she writes with this extraordinary care and that allows that allowed me to start rethinking my relationships with non-human animals. So that's yeah, that's how oh, I would answer that. Nice. Thank you. So Joshua, if you had the power to change one thing about the human non-human animal relationship, what would it be? This was the question that I didn't know how to answer. <laughs> um I it's 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 very funny. I, I suppose it would be um so, to 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 allow for humans to stop talking and to start listening, um, so it would be. Yeah, I mean, it's very funny because we're having a conversation. Yes, indeed, right now. But <laughs> bad I, news for podcasters. <laughs> but I really think that that's possibly the most important thing is that we need to to really listen. And I, I don't want to use the word stories because it's a human word, but there are stories that animals have to tell and we don't listen to those so it's about stopping and listening and 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 shutting up Mm, fascinating good advice so joshua what are you working on next that's a good question um i am i'm at the very beginning of a writing project so it's hard for me to talk about but i've recently become interested it's not the right word but i'm interested in in the notion of um fear um, and how that might be transformed into hope. So I grew up in the 1970s, 1980s, where the where our fear was nuclear annihilation fear, and the students that I teach, their fear is, is climate change fear, and they're the same fear. There's this ex- extraordinarily, overwhelmingly huge thing that we can't do anything about, um, but we can do things on a, on a local level, on an on on a intimate level. Um, so the the work that I'm thinking about is how do I write about the end of the world, which isn't about the end of the world. I think that's wow, um, fascinating. I look forward to <laughs> look me too. Forward it's to a long, 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 long way away. Um, but I, yeah, I, that's the, the, that's where the ideas sit. Right. Fantastic. Now. So, how can people find out more about your work? Um, well, uh, the book is available through Sydney University Press, so they can have a look there and see um, where it is is available to them. I'm a really terrible person with the internet, so I don't have a, a website. Um, but if you went to the University of Wollongong um, site, there are 
um, lists of my other publications there and they're, most of them are available um, online so you can read about those stories there. Um, there's lots of – I've got uh, two stories that are in um, the Animal um, Studies Journal which I think is a really, really important journal for us. Um, and so have a look through there and see what's going on. But, yeah, at some point I will get my act together and be 21st century. <laughs> no, that's very good advice to go to the Animal Studies Journal as well and check it out. It's certainly a, re- a treasure trove of um, work by Animal Studies scholars. Well, Joshua, thank you so much for joining us for the podcast. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for asking me. My pleasure. And thank you to the audience for joining us for Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about their work. The sound engineer on this episode of Knowing Animals was Oliver Lavaris. Sorry, Oliver, of course, I don't know how to say your name, but I'll work it out. And he's an audio producer and animal studies student at New York University. Now, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or on Facebook at knowing animals. We're okay at, on the internet over at knowing animals. And don't forget to tell other people about the podcast. Sharing it, forwarding it, and reviewing it at iTunes all helps grow the podcast so I can bring you more and more good news from the world of animal studies. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan, and I do like knowing animals. <laughs>